everyone, welcome back to my Bitcoin story. I'm your host, Dea Ruskita, and today we have special guest, Dan Clark from Singapore. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit story about how he lived totally out of Bitcoin in a paradise island. Welcome, Dan. Welcome to the show. Mm-hmm. This is very exciting. Like I, I spoke a little bit with Dan about uh, what we're going to talk about today, and I'm really excited to know about his trips at uh, the tricks and <laughs> tips about how you can live totally out of his bitcoin but maybe then can you tell us a little bit about your background sure um okay so thank you for having me um it's great to be uh here um i'm very very happy to be on your podcast um so the longest story of my background is like i'm from the uk um but i live in a few places um i lived in berlin germany for five years i uh, lived in dubai for three years then malaysia for a little bit uh then i moved to singapore and um started my own company in singapore ran that a little bit uh, then i lived a little bit in japan uh and then the last year or so i spent in in indonesia uh, for reasons we'll get into <laughs> um, um but before that when i was in the uk i did two weeks when i was 15 years old uh in my school they make you do what's called work experience so you mm-hmm. go and work in some some company or some place to get an experience of what the world of work is like and um i worked in a bank in my local hometown for two weeks mm-hmm. and i hated it i hated it <laughs> and i was like please god don't ever let me work in a bank ever i because i really hated it so um that kind of set me on the path of like okay yeah the banks are not your friend the banks are like an enemy and that kind of stuff so That was that. Then I, then I, um, my whole family are police officers in the UK. So I, I was a police officer for two years in the UK. Um, my family is still police officers. My dad, my mom, my sister, my uncle, my granddad, that dad. You know, they're all um, serving police officers. So that instilled like a sense of kind of like trust in the states, you know, that kind of stuff, and uh, you know, um, upholding what you think is right and a sense of justice and that kind of stuff. Um, it didn't work out for me. I didn't really get on with it. And so when I was 21, I stopped being a police officer. Um, and I looked where was the cheapest place to fly to. And the cheapest place to fly to happened to be Berlin, Germany, um, from my hometown airport of uh, East Berlin's airport. Now, I had I had studied German in school and I got a C, which is like a, you know an average grade. Um, so I could like speak like a very basic amount of German. Um, So being the impulsive kind of character I am, I, um, you know, I sold my car, I sold my motorbike at the time, I packed all my stuff together. Uh, I booked a one-way flight to Berlin. And I landed in Berlin in, I think, like, uh, May 2008. I didn't have anywhere to live. I didn't know any friends, anybody in the country. I had no friends or family, no connections or anything. Um, I landed there. I was like, well, let's see how this goes. <laughs> um, So I did that, and I ended up living there for five years. Um, the first year was kind of rough. Uh, you know, I taught English a little bit, like all the kind of like nothing stuff you do. Eventually, I found a job with an internet company, um, and they were Europe's largest price comparison website. Um, and they were launching a UK version of what they did in Germany. Uh, and they're like, okay, yeah, you need to be able to speak German. You need to be a native English speaker. So I lied and said, yeah, I speak German, sure. Um, and I went, for my, <laughs> I went for my interview and the guy that interviewed me was an English guy that didn't speak German. So tip number one, be lucky. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so I did that. I worked there for about two years uh, and they were a very big uh, SEO. So SEO stands for search engine optimization. It's about making websites appear higher, sorry for the noise, uh, higher in Google. Um, so I learned a bunch of tips and tricks there. Uh, and I was like, hey, this is pretty interesting. Um, so my My brain's wide in that way, like to kind of like al- analyze algorithms or whatever. Um, so I learned a bunch of stuff there. And then I um, moved to join another company. And they were like a big partner of Groupon. Do you remember Groupon? Remember Groupon back in like uh, 2010? Kind of yeah. Thing, right? um, so I joined another company and they were a big partner of Groupon. And so I was doing the SEO for them. Again, a German company that was launching in the UK and they wanted help to come up in Google. So I worked there for uh, about three months. And then Groupon directly kind of headhunted me out of that company say, come and work for Groupon. So I was like, oh, fantastic. So then I went and worked at Groupon. Um, I think this was 2011, something like that. Um, so I worked at Groupon, uh, effectively climbed the ranks internally, like to be like the head of SEO. So um, Groupon was an American company. 
but um, they acquired a company in Germany called MyCityDeal, which was like a German clone company from Rocket Internet. And Germany ran the whole world. So the US Chicago company ran the US and the, the German you know, subsidiary ran the rest of the world. Um, so we ran all the countries. And so I was basically in charge of running SEO for Groupon's international stuff for a, a fair amount of time. Um, did all that, Groupon did that IPO. You know, we got shares and all this kind of stuff and it was pretty, pretty cool time. Um, Groupon IPO'd and then like the, um, so then my friend who went to Groupon got moved to the Dubai office. Um, so I was like, okay. That's pretty cool. Let's see. So I, I, um, I went to Dubai. I was like, hey, I quite like Dubai. And then, you know, uh, just done with Groupon. But I worked for a couple of big uh, SEO agencies like uh, Mindshare, which is WPP Group, and then Publicis um, Group, the Sarcom, that kind of stuff. Um, then I start, Then I co-founded an SEO consulting agency um, in Dubai and then left that. And then I moved to Malaysia to work uh, for a venture builder in Malaysia doing SEO for them. Then I quit that, moved to Singapore, started my own SEO consulting company. This is 2015. Gave myself a visa, that kind of stuff. Uh, ran that, sold that. And then that's like 2017. 2017, then I took a year off, I believe. I traveled through America. I traveled through Europe. Uh, and I started to get involved in crypto. This is a time where I was like, okay, cryptocurrency is kind of a thing. Um, so a friend of mine at the time was like, you should put some money in crypto. And um, before this, I'd been running a website called expatfinance.net. It's like a financial advice website for expatriates. So if you're, a, if you're a foreigner and you're living in Dubai, you're living in Malaysia or Singapore. And I built that because I wanted to know how to invest my own money. And there was not any real good information. There's a lot of scammers out there and there wasn't a lot of information. So I thought to myself, if I build a website where I have to help, I have to teach people, that's going to help me learn better, right? So I built this website in uh, 2013, maybe, um, called, again, Expat Finance on that. And it was all about, here's how you open a brokerage account, the classic finance, traditional finance. Here's how you open a brokerage account, and here's how you analyze ETFs, and here's this kind of stuff. And so I started building up like an investment portfolio in equities. Um, and then that carried on through to about 2017. And my friend was like, you should take a look at crypto. You should take a look at uh, Bitcoin and stuff. And I was such a boomer <laughs> at the time. But I was like, it's so hard to buy Bitcoin. This is nonsense, blah, blah, blah. So my first exposure <laughs> to uh, the cryptocurrency world was like the worst way you can think about it. It was buying the Swedish exchange trader product through my brokerage. So wow. um, the more, most complicated way of buying. Yeah, yeah right. And the worst way, and it has the highest fees and kind of stuff. So I was like, uh, you know, uh, and I was, I was a Bitcoin skeptic. I was a crypto skeptic. I was a full crypto skeptic. I was like crypto um, convinced. And I was like, Bitcoin's nonsense. If you lose your key, it's ridiculous and blah, 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 blah. blah. I was like, up until 2017, I was like the skeptic. Which is why I'm more kind of like uh, easier on skeptics these days because I'm like everyone walks the, the Bitcoin path in their own time, right? If uh, I genuinely think if you don't approach Bitcoin as a skeptic at first, you're probably not going to make it because when you first hear about it, you should be skeptical because you should be using all of your critical faculties in your in your in your head and going, I'm not sure about this, mm, right? So if, you, if you're not a skeptic when you first hear about it, you will probably down the line be suckered into some other kind of scam. Some kind of stuff. So I approach it very much as skeptic. I have a friend of mine in Singapore who, you know, gives me shit all the time. It's like, you used to be a big skeptic and now you're all in. And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, fair, fair right? Um, so yeah, uh, my initial exposure was through the, the exchange report on the, the uh, Swedish NASDAQ and that kind of stuff. So I did that, exposure for some of that kind of stuff eventually figured out like how to OTP, OTP some, o, sorry, OTC, some money from my bank account into blah, blah, blah. Got, a, got a ledger, sorry, got a, a Trezor device, uh, started doing that kind of stuff. And I started, because I had, I had time off, I'd, I'd sold my company and I was kind of free. Um, so then I started um, to, for a friend, consulting a company that had done an ICO and they raised 30 million. Um, so I was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll invest in your private round and that kind of stuff. And I, that's what got me involved. Um, and I was in that kind of stuff. So the, at the time I was living in Singapore and I had a flatmate and he didn't have like a working permit in Singapore at the 
this time. Like he didn't have a bank account, this kind of stuff. So he was like, can I pay you my rent in Ethereum? So I was like, okay, yeah, right? <laughs> this was like, this was like the opening the door of like, you know, going full, full into crypto, right? So I would keep paying from my Singapore bank account in Singapore dollars, the rent to the landlord each month. And he would pay me in Ethereum, like, you know, each month. Um, so I started that. Uh, and then in that month off, sorry, sorry, in that year off, um, I didn't really work. I, I, I got paid some money through get the country, through my advisory, through this company, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and I took time off. And then, so then we're through to about 2018. So I realized, hey, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not quite rich enough to like retire. <laughs> so <laughs> probably need to find a job. <laughs> right. um, so then I, you know, spoke to some friends, whatever. I had a good friend that worked at TechCrunch at the time, uh, publication. Uh, and I was getting more and more interested in crypto, getting more into it. Um, then I basically applied for a job at Binance and had my friend kind of help me. And I went through rounds of interview and Binance was like, um, we've filled this position. This position has been filled. We've already got somebody in this position. And I was like, no, no. I won't accept no for an answer. <laughs> you, you, need to, you need to interview me at least. So they interviewed me and the guy they had hired interviewed me. Uh, and because I've been doing uh, SEO for like 10 BC, Nissan, you know, Groupon, you know, I was pretty good at what I did. So I went to the interview and um, they had, and they were like, oh, well maybe we'll interview you and just leave you like on file if you need something later. And I was like, just, just interview me. Let's go. So they interviewed me and they had the guy that they had just hired interview me. Um, and, and he was a British guy. It's a British Chinese guy. Um, and he interviewed me uh, and I prepared like a 40 page like audit of the plans. I, I listed every sound. I was like, here's all the problems you have. I'd done like a big, thick document. Um, I delivered it. And I was like, so yeah, here's what I think about. It was like, here's what we need to do better and blah, 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 blah. And the guy was like, yeah okay this guy's good um <laughs> yeah yeah so i was like i told you i told you i'm pretty good at what i do um and then they decided just to open a role for me they opened a new headcount for me uh and hired me in and that was to work on the Binance academy project so mm -hmm. i just i basically steamrolled my way in by just saying like look you need me i'm really good i'm really keen let's go let's go, let's go. um so they hired me into Binance academy so then i launched Binance academy with another guy me and one other guy basically launched Binance academy you know Binance academy yeah like it's one yeah. of the comprehensive academy for crypto yeah. Well, right yeah yeah so we launched that so i was like the architect behind that so i hired my friend to be the developer uh for that whole project and like external contractor and i said here's what we're going to do i had great support from the rest of the team inside finance and we built Binance Academy and launched it. Um, and then after Binance Academy was launched, it started doing well. The traffic was like going up, 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 right? As we knew it would. Um, so then eventually I moved from Binance Academy into the Binance kind of global and ran SEO for them for uh, about two years. Wow. So you also did the same thing like what you did on the uh, expat finance Right, like you, yeah. you learn about cryptocurrency by doing the academy by like, teaching. By because, teaching, yeah. If you, yeah, if you want to understand something, try and explain it to somebody else. If you can't explain it to somebody else, then you don't understand it, right? Exactly, so yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's the best way. So when I was in Berlin, I lived in Berlin. I said for five years. Um, I I took a little job as a tour guide because I wanted to know more about the city. So taking a job as a tour guide makes you number one see the city through. Um, tourist eyes every day and it, and they ask you questions and if you don't know the answer then you have to go and find it so my whole kind of uh yeah vibe has been um try and teach people stuff if you want to understand it try and teach people because if you don't know say oh, i don't know but i'll find out you don't find out um you mentioned a little bit that you were a bitcoin skeptic right so yeah. Yeah. what was the uh yeah like what was the turning point tipping for point. you the tipping point yeah yeah um, I wouldn't say there was any one tipping point. It's, it's just like a, like a, a, a frog in a boiling pot, right? Or like, you know, there's a, there's a famous quote that someone said that they spoke to a, a rich guy once that lost all of his money and they said, how did it happen? And he said, slowly at first and then all at once. And I think that's kind of like how it works for Bitcoin. Like you, you get into something. So I was like, maybe I'll allocate one or 2% of my portfolio 
Maybe I'll do that and then and then we'll see. Um, and that one two percent starts to grow and this kind of stuff. And then then I find myself I, I put like a hundred thousand dollars into my friend's ICO. Uh, and it's you know clearly more than one two percent that was. Um, and then we just started you know going. And then I don't think there was any one day where I was like, okay, the pain is strong. It was just a peeling of the onion, right? Slowly taking the, the layers away. Um, but I do remember when I worked for Binance and when Binance opened their Binance Singapore office and they opened the Singapore uh, exchange, um, I, I transferred in 50 or 100 thousand like, like into Binance SG. And then I, I bought Bitcoin. I didn't buy anything. I was like, right, I'm just going to go in on Bitcoin. Um, and I think that was kind of like the last time that I moved fiat into crypto. Because when I was at Binance, obviously I'm getting paid in BNB. So Binance pays in those in BNB mostly, for the most part. So I was getting paid in crypto. So I get paid a fixed US dollar amount, but you get paid in BNB. So if BNB is down, you get paid more BNB. BNB is up, you get paid more. Uh, sorry, fewer. Um, and that was through twenty. That was through the end of 2018, all the way through to mid 2020. So I was getting paid in BNB tokens when they were like four dollars. Right, so you, know, you can do the math there, right? It's pretty, uh, you know, exponential and some of that stuff. Um, but towards towards late 2020, I started to get a little bit disillusioned. Uh, and I'm though I would be paid in BNB, I would just convert it to BTC immediately. So I'd go get paid in BNB, convert to BTC. Like I, I wasn't holding out, but there was a period up until uh, early 2020 where I was. Not a BNB maximalist, but I, you know, I held a lot of uh, which again, kind of lucky played out for me because in December 2018, I think BNB was like four dollars, um, and then the ratio against BTC, I sold that, uh, you know, I sold it a pretty good ratio into the BTC. I don't think it's ever come back to that same level. Um, so again, some part of it's been lucky. But the, sorry, the point I was making is um, being paid in crypto. Uh, means that uh, I, I started to eschew the, the the fiat banking system. So I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't getting paid in, in Singapore dollars or US dollars, or whatever. Um, I was getting paid in crypto. Um, so that that sort of like made me transition into being fully into crypto. Like kind of not by choice, just just by the fact that I did that. And if I did consulting work for anybody, they would pay me in crypto. It's easier. If if I were to pay you now. It would be a no-brainer. I wouldn't ask you for your IBAN or whatever, right? I would say, you know, I'll, I'll send you USDC or, you know, whatever, right? So people that are in the crypto world, it's almost like, oh, you want to be paid in fiat? That's what's wrong with you, right? It's, you, you cross that chasm, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so basically by receiving a lot of salary with, um, yeah, BNB, so you don't need to use any bank account. And I tell you, right, right? like, the, the point where this changed. So it wasn't a point where I was like, I'm on crypto, but in December 2018, my friend told me about crypto.com. You know crypto.com? Yeah, I heard, yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. So crypto.com, you have a uh, Visa card. So my card is kind of worn out and all the designs crashed off of it or whatever. Here's my, I put a little stick on it. <laughs> um, so in December 2018, crypto.com was quite new. Um, and they were only sending cards out in Singapore. So at the time I was in Japan, I've been living in Japan for about two months, something. Uh, but I ordered the card. I went through all the KYC, I ordered the card, to get it delivered to my apartment in Singapore. And I flew back to Singapore, uh, something like the 22nd of December to, uh, get back here. And I had like, I think three days before I flew to the UK for Christmas, right? So I came back. Got to my apartment, post box, yes, got out my crypto.com card. And I was like, wow, this is game So at first, I didn't trust them because I'm a skeptic, right? So I'm a, I'm a total skeptic. So I, I got the card, which was at the time 50 MCO tokens, which was $50. That was like the, uh, the first tier above the free one. So I got that card because I was like, I don't trust them because I'm not anybody. And if this is a scam, Okay, I'm out fifty dollars. It's not the worst in the world. So I, I got back and got my card. Yeah, da, 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 set up my card and stuff. I was like, wow, oh my god, this is amazing. 
Um, so I transferred some BNB into my crypto account, account and then cashed it out for Singapore dollars on my card, ran downstairs, ran to the 7-Eleven outside my apartment, uh, had the card in my hand, 7-Eleven. I bought like a bottle of, uh, you know, a bottle of soft drink, whatever, scanned the card, worked. And I was like, all right, <laughs> this is a game changer. Because now I don't have to like uh, mess around with like all this nonsense of like, oh, you've got to sell like large amount of crypto and then OTC or whatever. It's like you can sell small amounts of money you need and spend it on this card. So anywhere you can pay using Vita, you can go and use this. And I was like, this is insane. So I remember I went to, uh, so Binance had a, had a whole company um, skiing trip in 2019. Uh, and there were some guys or something like, like some of these places where it's hard where the crypto is hard. and I was like if you send me BNB I will buy stuff for you on my crypto account card and they're like that's amazing because they have to like you know go through all this nonsense so that's the point where I realized like yeah I don't I don't need a bank account right I told them a bank account because now anything I need to buy anything with Visa I can buy my salary comes in crypto uh, on this kind of stuff so that was kind of one of the turning points where I was like, I don't need a bank account. But what was the pros and cons of, you know, uh, I mean, the pros is that, yeah, you, now you can pay everything uh, easily, but do you have any yep. cons of that account? <laughs> um, I, I can't really think of any cons because you get more cash back on your card. Uh, it's accepted everywhere that Visa accepted. You get free Netflix, you get free Spotify. Um, so, no, I can't really think of any cons. I can only think of pros. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So maybe maybe we go um, uh, to your stories. Like uh, one of the things that sure. I found really interesting because you told me that you were you had a holiday in Bali <laughs> last year during pandemic. Yeah. And then you got yeah. stuck in Bali where, you yeah. know, in a country like in Indonesia, they don't doesn't allow transaction in Bitcoin or any other crypto. Yeah. So how do you work around that, and what was your experience? Sure. So uh, in early 2019, um, Chinese New Year 2019, um, it was like Chinese New Year is coming up. It's going to be boring in Singapore. And I had a friend that lived in China, uh, a guy from school, like a white guy like me, lived in China. And he said, "Let's go somewhere for Chinese New Year." I was like, "Sure." Like, why don't we go to Jakarta? it's close it's whatever i didn't see so went to jakarta um i'd been to jakarta a few times but i was like ah it's jakarta I mean, you know, no one really loves jakarta let's, let's be honest right <laughs> but it's, uh, it's somewhere to go right it's not good um so i went there and um then i you know met a girl uh and you know we fell in love um so then suddenly i had this uh indonesian girlfriend uh in jakarta and then so like, okay, well maybe I need to spend more time in Jakarta. Maybe I need to, <laughs> right? Maybe I need to um, think about like trying to make that work. Um, so we did that, and then me and her were dating, blah 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 blah, for a, a long time. Um, and that continued. So I would I would go down to Jakarta and spend time there. Uh, and I, and while I was there, I helped Binance set up a bunch of stuff. So I helped Binance set up like the first ever meetup in Indonesia, because um, I slowly started to like love Indonesia. I mean. Right. So I was like, okay, I love it. Of course, I love so you're, you're wearing a batik, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> exactly. I'm wearing my best batik for your feel. But I liked it because it's a very young country. The demographically, it skews very young. I think like the average age of people in the is like 30 something, right? It's a country that's fairly rebellious in its nature. It's the only country to ever leave the UN, right? So it's, it's a country that's not afraid to stick it to the mat, right? right? <laughs> Which I love also. It's a young country. Uh, kind of rebellious, not a lot of trust in government, right? Kind of like, it's, it's kind of a little bit keen to like stick. The 1997 financial crisis, through some mistrust. Um, so I was like, this is a great country for crypto. It really is. This is a country that's like, if there were ever a country, and, and only one third of the country is, um, is banked. Two thirds of the country don't have bank accounts. So I was like, this is amazing. This is a perfect country. Um, which is why Binance Academy, one of the first languages that I insisted that we did was Bahasa. Um, so anyway, started to you know, love the country. I thought this is great. Spent more and more time there, helped Binance set some stuff up there, yada, 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 right? Go through. So then we're through to um, 2020. 
uh, March 2020, my girlfriend says, let's go on holiday to um, Moto Island. So I was like, sure. So um, I flew to Jakarta. We met up in Jakarta. And this is when um, coronavirus is just like, just starting to come up, right? So my flight from Singapore to Jakarta was like $9. <laughs> because no, no one was flying. It was all for panic. So I flew to Jakarta. Then we flew to Komodo Island, a little little plane with like a propellers and stuff. You know, I don't know if you've been to Komodo Islands, but we had a week there. Met the Komodo dragons, that kind of stuff. Flew back to Jakarta, uh, and then I was supposed to fly back to Singapore. So I live in Singapore, I got a visa in Singapore, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the Singapore government was like, "Four is closed. Four is closed." End discussion. Even if you have a working visa, even like everything, doesn't matter. If you're not here already, or So I was like, oh, what am I gonna do? Um, so I was like, okay, don't worry. You know, we've been through worse things. Um, so then I think the, the Indonesian government was like, all right, look, stuff has gone down. Uh, they said to everybody, if you're in the country already, your visa is good. Don't worry about it. There was some point, I think, in March, it was just like, all right, look, any foreigners that are here, Yeah, you whatever. don't have to extend. Just, you just, like, stay here on emergency. Don't, yeah. Yeah. So I, I pulled the embassy, I went to the, the, all that kind of stuff, and they were like, dude, don't, like, you're here, just chill out, right? <laughs> just relax. Um, so we're in, uh, and my visa's been kind of waiting. It's like, all good. So um, then uh, my girlfriend uh, got given the permission to work from home on her from her company because her company was like all right work from home so as soon as she got that i was like we are getting the fuck out of Jakarta immediately <laughs> i was like if you can work from anywhere you don't get the rate right? i am not staying in Jakarta. so um we were like she was like where are you gonna go and i was like bali we're going to bali <laughs> we're going to bali um and then this was the same day where like the British government is putting planes on. The British government, like the Dominic Raab, the foreign secretary, is flying like planes to Bali to pick up people to fly them back from Bali because they're like, oh, we're stranded in Bali. And I was like, forget that, right? So um, <laughs> I'm here to yeah. stay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I ain't going nowhere. So uh, flew to Bali. Uh, this is again like March 2020. Flew to, <laughs> to Bali. I went on Airbnb. And because like, Indonesia at this point had closed the border as well. Indonesia closed the border. Everyone's closed the border. Um, all the tourists are fleeing. Like all the all the foreign tourists are like fleeing. Like like get out, get out, get out, get out. So um, you could rent a villa in Bali with like a simple and stuff for like six hundred dollars a month, like US dollars. I was like, yes, in right. Um, so yeah, flew to Bali, negotiated like a cheaper deal, just go down, had a villa in Bali, and I was like. We're so lucky. Like, this is the luckiest, like, you know, global pandemic. I'm stranded in the gym. I literally can't leave, right? Even if I want to leave, I can't go back. Um, so just, like, played our cards right. We got a villa in Bali. And it was amazing. So, and then we still respected all the kind of stuff. Like, we wouldn't go out to restaurants. We'd only go out, like, once a month. Rented a motorbike. Ride to the, um, wait, what's the name of the supermarket? Uh, anyway, but anyway, we'd ride to the supermarket, uh, buy some food, come back. Uh, get Gojek go through delivery. Is it is it noisy? Can you hear about the noise? Uh, yeah, we can hear it a little bit. <laughs> ah, sorry about that. Um, hope you can still hear me. Um, but anyway, yeah. So that kind of stuff, and then stayed in the Airbnb for a month, and then uh, each month we just like find a new Airbnb to, to get a new deal. So I did that for about four months, uh, through to like um, September-ish, I think. Yeah, so that kind of time. Because the whole time in the news was like, if you're here, just stay here. Like, don't worry about it. And Singapore's like, you can't come back. I, try, I applied to get permission to enter back into Singapore. And they're like, no, you're not a medical worker. You're not like an emergency worker. No. Uh, so I was like, okay, we'll get some stuff here. Um, so just chill I mean, in Bali, basically. <laughs> basically, basically. Basically, the Indonesian government and the Singapore government were like, just stay where you are and calm down. And I was like, okay, if those are the orders, right? Sure thing. Uh, and I did. Um, and I, I left finance in July um, and stopped working here. So then I was completely kind of like uh, just just hanging out the whole time. The point is like the whole time I was in Indonesia, I didn't have a bank account because you can't get a bank account without key tasks or and that kind of stuff, right? So I was completely kind of free. But I had my crypto.com card so I could 
I could spend Bitcoin on my Visa card. So I could book an apartment through, uh, book a villa through Airbnb using Bitcoin. Um, I could go to an ATM and take rupiah out of the ATM with Bitcoin. Uh, if we go to a restaurant, I can pay using Bitcoin. So Bitcoin kind of saved my life right? <laughs> because um, I don't know what I would have done otherwise. It was, uh, you could, so yeah, you, you can't you can't pay using um, Bitcoin in Indonesia, but I never did technically. I paid using my Visa card and I paid in in Indonesian rupiah, and so yeah, I loved it. I had uh, you know I'd put a bunch of my Bitcoin, I put like almost all my Bitcoin into Crypto.com's Earn product. So there's a Crypto.com Earn, and you earn uh, eight point five percent interest on your Bitcoin. So each week I would get like a little uh, interest payment into my account. And I was like, that was enough to live off of. So I was like, okay, I'm not working. I'm not breaking any rules that I know of, right? Uh, I'm stranded here. And I'm just living purely on Bitcoin, like 100% living on Bitcoin. And not only was I living, I was like living, right? I was living a nice life uh, in it. So, you know, after month two, I think we upgraded to a better villa and we just keep upgrading like to a better villa. So we had a villa that had like a cleaners every day, you know, great fullness kind of stuff. And I was like, we're so so blessed during this pandemic where everyone is kind of like suffering and losing their mind and, and upset i was like okay i didn't ask for this but i made the best of a terrible situation so you said that uh because of this crypto.com has uh, like an earn interest that's how you can um mm-hmm. spend bitcoin without lose your bitcoin holding is that correct yeah so is there any other yeah way? so there's i mean for, for people to like, you know, yeah, because there may be also any other way for people to um, not lose sure. their coin holding. Sure. So there's obviously risks and there's, there's people that say that, you know, this is terribly risky to um, use the Crypto.com earn products and that kind of stuff. I know Crypto.com guys. I'm friends with the CEO and the CEO. Like I, I know them personally. Um, so I don't feel a lot of risk there. But each to his own. I'm not about to kind of like push this and... Uh, and people get mad at me if something happens, right? Um, but I feel fairly confident and in, in my understanding of how they earn that interest and, and how they pay it. So um, for me, my biggest source of income at that time uh, and still is having my, my crypto locked in these products and earning interest. Um, if you're not really agreeable to that, some of, so I have half of my crypto portfolios on crypto.com, half of it now is on FTX. Um, FTX also have a lending platform where you can lend out your Bitcoin. It's, it's very over collateralized. So people that borrow it are, you know, very over collateralized. Um, I have some USD on my FTX account, which I lend out as well. But you typically get like 20% interest on your USD, right? So it's pretty, pretty high. Um, the other things that you can do are things that I have done is you can sell uh, call options. If, you, if you've ever heard Dan Held, talk about like the ways that he kind of monetizes Bitcoin, uh, same kind of stuff I'm doing. So you can go to Deribit and you can sell um, out of the money call options and make some make some kind of revenue off of Bitcoin there. Uh, on FTX for a while, I was selling call options and you can, you can make a decent kind of uh, revenue stream there for your Bitcoin. Um, so it means is you just, you just use your existing Bitcoin to earn more Bitcoin. So you're never drawing down. So I'm, I'm thankfully at the point now where uh, my Bitcoin holdings grow every single day, effectively, because of these, you know, various passive income streams. So my big, my, I'm just stacking sats every single day. Every single day, I'm stacking sats. Um, and even with the cost of my living, like like I'm paying for my rent and stuff, and I'm paying for you know going out and like, having a beer or whatever. Um, still, I'm stacking sats every single day. So uh, it's not for everybody, but go ahead. So you think like saving your money in Bitcoin is way more superior than saving money in the bank? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if I save it in a bank, I might get like what, 0.1% interest or something. Same, you know, put US dollars in FTX.com. Um, you're getting 20%. Like, even if you're just thinking about US dollars, if, you, if, you, if you're a, a full crypto skeptic and you don't believe in the price appreciation of Bitcoin. Um, but the good thing about um, earning interest in your Bitcoin is it's 8.5% in Bitcoin. So it's not in fiat. So if Bitcoin goes up, you still earn even more because it's like, if you have, you know, 
if you had 100 Bitcoin, you would get 8.5 Bitcoin per year in interest, right? Not like the fiat equivalent. So, um, yeah, no, it's been very, very good for me. Um, I'm very happy um, to continue to do that. Um, so, what do you think about, like, you know, when if you lend your Bitcoin to um, a third party, that means that these people is becoming your Bitcoin custodian. Uh, what happened if like, let's say the company uh, got shut down or like, you know, you yeah. lose access of your Bitcoin. Like how, yeah. how we can mitigate that? Of course, it's a risk and there, you know, there are more extreme. So I'm something of a Bitcoin maximum, right? I think I have about 98% of my money is in Bitcoin. So I don't think anybody could, could accuse me of not being a Bitcoin maxi. Right? Um, Labels are do what they make. Um, but the point is, uh, for me, I lived a fairly itinerant lifestyle last year. Like I didn't have a fixed apartment. I didn't have a fixed address, right? Um, I was in Bali for a little bit. I was in Gili for a while. I was in Jakarta for a bit. I was in Singapore, this kind of stuff. So whilst um, self-custody is a thing, I'm not going to kind of doubt that, right? Self-custody is a good idea. If you if you don't have a fixed kind of address, if you're on the move, if you're this kind of stuff, um, where am I going to store my ledger? You no, know, what in a bank in Jakarta? Then when I'm in Bali, I can't access it. When I'm in Gili, I can't. Well, I'm going to leave it in a in a bank in you know a bank deposit box in Singapore. Well, then the whole last year, when I can't get back in Singapore, if I can it with me, that's a risk. You know, if I go through airport security, read my, um, you know, seed phrases, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm terrible at remembering passwords as it is. Um, it's not great, but I am still happy to defer custody of my assets to exchanges. Because I believe with the right security settings, for most people, and the hardcore maxes will hate me, but for most people, storing your Bitcoin on exchange is the right approach because of all of the possible points of failure with self about Using a seed phrase or, you know, putting it somewhere or it's in the news recently of, you know, oh, this guy can't remember his password for like $700 million of Bitcoin. Kind of stuff. Um, and I know, you know, I have friends of mine here in Singapore and other places that, you know, hold like, 30, 50 million dollars of Bitcoin, and they hold it on exchanges. So um, I think we're at a place now where yes, you have to accept not your keys, not your Bitcoin. I get that. No one's no one's doubting that that fact. Um, but there is a benefit of having it on exchange. When Binance got hacked for 70 million dollars, right? The customers of Binance lost zero pence. They lost zero cents because Binance had its insurance that kicked in. Crypto.com have really good security. They also have insurance. FTX have pretty good insurance, uh, pretty good security. Um, it is a tie-off that each person must think about. But I do think in 2021, the idea of it must absolutely be own keys, own custody, blah, blah is maybe not always the best advice. I'm really careful to word it because I don't want to get all the, <laughs> all the hardcore max coming at me. Um, but again, look, I have, a, I have a friend that used to work for MI5 and he keeps his Bitcoin on, on exchange. Right? He was cybersecurity. So it's, it's a bit narrative breaking, but there we go. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, how safe you know I mean? it is in, yeah, like uh, you mentioned that in the exchange they have like insurance, but like exchange is not bank they are not insured by fdic for example uh yeah. what, what kind of insurance that exchange has um the exchange that the that uh sorry the insurance exchange has is almost entirely social the fact that if they were to uh put those losses onto their customers, they would be toast. So the big exchanges make billions of dollars in revenue. And they make billions, of, billions and billions of revenue, but they make billions of dollars in, um, uh, in profit, right? So I think Binance made a billion dollars in profit within 18 months of starting. 
I think it's something like the numbers around it. Um, envelope kind of like calculation. If they had not uh, reimbursed their users for the 70 million loss, right? Clients would have been sunk, right? And they would have stopped having the ability to print that much revenue to print that much profit. So on a pure kind of like um, cost, you know, risk analysis, it makes sense for these exchanges to socially ensure users' deposits, right? Now, again, if, if that loss had been in the billions of dollars, no, right, the company would have gone under. Um, which is why if you stick with high level reputable exchanges that do like large amounts of money. So I remember reading Arthur Hayes' post, things like Dreams of a Peasant or something. He said, lending money, if, if you lend your crypto to large exchanges, um, they have no incentive to, to not pay you back because the, again, risk benefit analysis. And again, look, I may be sitting here now and I may look very stupid in two years time if there's a big hack uh, and, you know, this all proves to be completely wrong. That is part of the risk that I'm taking. So uh, I'm aware, like if something, if crypto.com is hacked massively, right, and they go under or there's massive fraud and they go under, right, that's part of the risk adjustment ratio that, that, I, that I've taken on board. So I, I, I was in a villa in Bali when the wire card scandal broke. You know about the wire card scandal? No. So the wire card was the card provider. Wire card was the card provider for the company. And it was the biggest scandal in German post-war history. There's a multi-billion dollar fraud. So their card provider went under owing billions of dollars to um, whatever. And there was like rumors at the time, like crypto.com is going to go under. Crypto.com is going to go under uh because gonna, you know this is gonna bring down this kind of stuff uh I, you know i wrote that and that was again this is germany this is not like a emerging economy like myanmar or something this is germany like you'd think that if you have your if you have your finances in a german bank god that's safe that's incredibly safe right they're very prudent that's right um so to have gone through the wire card scandal where the car provider blew up and basically died and owed billions of dollars and had had lied to the German government and all this kind of stuff. And for crypto to come, to come out of the back of that clean, you know, I, I I already had confidence. I still think I have quite a lot of confidence. But again, so the point the other point is if you are going to leave your coins on an exchange, right, which works for me because of the reason I said like not having a you know for this kind of stuff, if you are going to leave them on exchange, the risk between self-custody and on exchange is maybe like here to here, right? The risk between then lending them to the exchange is maybe here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because the, the, the biggest risk is leaving the coin to exchange. So hmm. then invite the extra risk of lending them out and getting interest is like tiny amount. Hmm. Again, it's a... It's a... I guess with any kind of money that you need to figure it out what you want to do with it, right? Like, you know, you want to just store it. Do you want to make yeah. your money yeah. works for you? Then you have to lend it or you have to like, yeah, you have to make it work kind of like that. Yeah. Again, it, 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 each person must arrive at their own decision and at their own choice, right? And the other point is like, I came to Bitcoin as a big skeptic saying it's a scam, it's terrible, right? And then now I'm lending my Bitcoin out on exchanges. There are people that were came to Bitcoin and said, it's not a scam, it's, it's legit, but still haven't gone as far as to lend it out on exchanges, right? So I, I, if you look at the gap that I've got, I've gone from big skeptic to doing this, right? Where yeah. there are people that were <laughs> above me already that haven't gone that far. So I'm not here to give advice to anybody. I'm just about <laughs> here to share your experience. Yeah. What works for me. Yeah, exactly. And maybe um, you've you've been in 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 Southeast Asia and again also got a lot of insight about the market in here in terms of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. So how do you see the roles of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin uh, in Southeast Asia in general? So I think Singapore will continue to be at the front. Um, if you look at even what happened during the 1997 financial crisis, Singapore was like a safety kind of stuff, right? Uh, I spent a lot of time in Asia, obviously. I love Indonesia. I can't speak as much about hash as I'd like to, but I 
sometimes I try, right? <laughs> I try. Um, but I, like Singapore was like the the, the stalwart, right? So during the, even the nine nine seven crisis, people would move their finances, particularly the um, Chinese Indonesians, move their money to you know Singapore and stuff. Um, I think Southeast Asia is more ripe, more receptive to cryptocurrency than maybe some of the Western countries might talk about. Uh, and a friend recently told me something. He said, um, if you meet people on their anti-cryptocurrency, you've got to tell them to check their currency privilege. Because anyone that's like uh, approaches, I have never met somebody that approached um, cryptocurrency and said it was a scam that didn't have currency privilege. It means like, oh, you've lived in a, um, you've lived in a, a, a rich Western country and you've had stable inflation for like 30 years, right? You don't know what it's like. Speak to somebody in um, Venezuela, in Ecuador, in Argentina, in Indonesia, um, you know, in these places, right? So I think these places are, are more ripe for it. Um, there's obviously, the added idea of kind of risk, because in many Southeast Asian countries, you can't rely on the government to protect you uh, in several ways, right? I'm not about to dunk on any any country, but you know, the level of consumer protection stuff in most Southeast Asian countries is lower than it would be in developed nations. So there's obviously a risk. Um, but I think Indonesia, again, as I said earlier, Indonesia is a very young country. It's a, it's a fairly unbanked country. It's a country that has, um, somewhat level of distrust in, in government money, right? Um, I think, uh, you know, which is why, you know, I, I work with the guys at IDRT. I, I know you uh, recently interviewed Jeff, um, great guy, good friend of mine. Um, as soon as I met them, I loved what they were doing. And I was like, yes, yeah, great. So again, um, when I was living in Indonesia and I had to pay like, uh, you know, I had to pay my girlfriend something. And she wasn't yet, she wasn't yet on the crypto train. She was like, I don't, I don't believe crypto. So what I would do is I'd take my Bitcoin, convert it to IERT, and I made her make an, an account IERT. I'd send to her and she'd cash it out to her bank account. So before she was, I could still go from pure Bitcoin to Indonesian rupee with like one hop. Bitcoin to IERT on Binance.com, send to her, she cash it out. And so thankfully now she's, she's convinced. Go ahead. So what 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 do you see the 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 role of stable coin with Bitcoin at the moment? I mean, you hear a lot of like uh, people talk about like how Tether is like pumping Bitcoin, yeah, yeah. all this thing. But what do you see yeah. uh, the role of stable coin uh, in in Bitcoin space? In the crypto space, yeah, I. Um, hmm. I think I think stable coins are definitely here to stick around forever. I don't think they're going anywhere. Um, I don't I don't believe in the in the tether flood really. Um, I have a lot of friends that have been you know using US, USDT for a long time. Um, you know friends that work for sovereign wealth funds and you know serious serious people um, that don't they don't give much credence to this uh, tether flood idea. Um, I think stable coins are a great way. And I give you the best example. As I said, I used to I used to pay my so when I was stuck in Indonesia, um, I would pay my rent to my girlfriend in IDRT. I set her up with a, I set her up with a trust wallet. I set her up with a um, rupee token .com account. Um, and when when I had to pay like half of the rent to her, so some we spent a little bit of time in Jakarta, where it wasn't with Airbnb. It was like um, she rented a cost, right? A cost. Um, she would pay for my bank account to rent that cost. Uh, she's like, you need to pay me rupiah. I don't want any of your non-cryptocurrency. So I was like, okay, well, then I would send her IDRT. And then, she, you know, she got used to that. She got used to the idea of wallets and stuff. Um, it's good. But I think the biggest thing about stable coins is like interest yield. You can, you know, you can use stable coins through DeFi, which I'm not a big DeFi guy. I'm, I'm really not. Um, I used Uniswap. Like once I connected to it, I connected to my what's Uniswap, and I was like, oh, pay $30 for a transaction. I was like, nah. And so I left it, and then I got the 400 tokens anyway. So I just sold them. Um, so look, I, I plugged around, but I'm not a big DeFi guy. But 
Uh, again, on crypto.com, you can earn like twelve um, percent on your stable points. On FTX, you can earn like twenty. Like, there's a big, big deal because uh, you know degenerate gamblers want to take that, uh, well, let want to borrow it, and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, even Gemini now, Gemini is regulated like crazy, and they're offering a good yield on their stable points. So um, I think the stable coins like open the door to crypto skeptics, like. Hey, you know, get used to it. Address, deposit, withdraw. You know, immutability of contract and that kind of stuff. Uh, and they definitely serve a purpose. They definitely do. So, uh, I'm sure you've been paid uh, for, for work. And what do you get paid in? You get paid in stable coins. I get paid in stable coins, right? If I do work for people, they will they will pay me stable coins, right? Uh, um, so they absolutely have a value, uh, and I. I've worked with people that have worked at BitConnect, this kind of stuff. I think the telephone is kind of nonsense, to be honest with you. But there we go. All right. So I, I really love our conversation, but I think I have to wrap it up. Uh, maybe uh, then, can you, yeah, maybe share like what is your advice for people who just, you know, start. Uh, investing in Bitcoin on how they can get rid of their Bitcoin skeptic or like. Yeah, like what is your what is your um, sure. advice? Yeah. Again, so look, I I came to this whole space as a big skeptic. I was like, cryptos are nonsense. It's it's, it's bullshit, lower. So I have walked that same path. Right? Uh, it's, I'm not I'm not coming like so. I walked exactly the same path. Um, and I think it's easier now to walk that path than it was when I did it. Because now you have uh, Elon Musk, you have Tesla, you have Harvard, uh, Yale, endowment, you have all this kind of stuff. Uh, but to the biggest skeptics, I would say this is a this is a new asset class, and the only free lunch in investing is diversification. It's the only free lunch in, in entire investing. So if you put one or two percent of your portfolio into Bitcoin or into cryptocurrency. You're going to move up that efficient frontier in, in investments called the efficient frontier, where you get the best uh, risk and just reward. Um, so there's literally at this point no good reason to be at zero crypto in your portfolio. If you're managing a portfolio of you know hundred thousand dollars, million dollars, whatever, there is zero good reason to be at zero percent allocation, and there's a whole bunch of good reasons um, to be above that. Because again, if you only were to allocate one percent of it, your portfolio is going to do maybe seven percent a year. If if that one percent goes to zero, you're not out. Rather. But what you get is the benefits of a non-correlated asset diversification. Um, so yeah, I think that would be my biggest advice to people. And my advice to people is a little bit further on that is you want to be stacking sats every day because Elon Musk is. Uh, Michael Saylor is adding more sats. Like everybody, all this promo is going on. So if you're not stacking sats, they are. Uh, this is your chance to front run all of the bankers that screwed you over in 2008. This is your chance to front run uh, Tesla. I bought Bitcoin before Elon Musk did. How cool is that, right? So did you? So did yeah. you, right? Right? Yes. You bought Bitcoin before the richest guy on earth, right? I and know. do you think? Do you think? Do you think they're all? Do you think, do you think that's it? That it's over now. Do you think everyone's stopping? No, you'd be out of your mind. It's it's just accelerated. Yeah. So, um, if you're a little bit further down the line, stack that, stack that. Um, take the rest of your money that you don't need each month, put it into Bitcoin, keep stacking. Um, it's it's gonna be fine. I'm very happy. You know, uh, worked very well for me. <laughs> Yeah, the path towards uh, early retirement, it's on crypto. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then, thank you so much for yeah for being the guest at this My Bitcoin Story. And uh, if you want to follow Dan, your Twitter handle is Dan Clarky. And... Dan Clarky, yeah. So my, na my name is Dan Clark, but my email, my Twitter handle is D-A-N-C-L-A-R-K-I-E. That's what my nickname is called. Cool. Yeah then go follow him on twitter uh thank you so much and i hope you have a great day in singapore thank you for listening to the my bitcoin story stay tuned for more episode and click that follow button